Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. One of the most long-standing debates in the communist movement is the question of whether it's possible to build socialism within the boundaries of a single country. To help us deal with this question, we have with us Nicholas Alpin Svensson, who is a member of the International Secretariat of the Revolutionary Communist International. A spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I mean, it's in the name of the organization that it's, we belong to, the Revolutionary Communist International. A bit of a clue about where we stand on this question. When we were planning this episode, you brought to my attention a statement put out on social media by the youth wing of the Communist Party of Britain, the Young Communist League, which juxtaposes the so-called theory of socialism in one country with the theory of permanent revolution, which is an idea that was developed by Trotsky in 1905-1906 and is the basis for the way that we think about the revolutionary process in the modern age. We'll get into the details about the differences, but um, the YCL, they make the case that yes, it is possible to build socialism in a single country, and they point to the example first and foremost of the USSR. They say in October 1917, Vladimir Lenin led the Bolshevik party to establish the world's first socialist state, and that after Lenin's death, the debate broke out that centred over the question of whether it was possible to build socialism in isolated and backward Russia. And Stalin, they say, answered the question in the affirmative with the theory of socialism in one country, Trotsky in the negative with the theory of permanent revolution. So we can talk a bit more about the way that the Communist Party puts this idea across, but what's the essence of socialism in one country? Well, I think they they explain it fairly well uh, themselves. They talk about what what are the conditions for the possibility of socialism in one country. I mean, I don't agree that there is of such a possibility, but the way they describe these conditions. Previously, it was considered, and this Stalin says the same thing uh, in his discussions. They said previously it was considered impossible to build socialism in one country, but because of the development of imperialism, uh, then it was now possible to build socialism in, in one country because of the, what they call a breach in the imperialist front. They basically admit that this is a new thing. Right? This is an innovation in Marxist theory that comes out of this situation. So now it was possible no, uh, to build socialism just in one country. Mm. That's the basic idea which Stalin put forward. Uh, Stalin and Bukharin, it should be added, put forward in 1924, 25, 26 and which uh, the, the YCL here in this there on their Twitter account are repeating, basically. Yeah, I'll just put forward verbatim the way that they present it so that no one can accuse us of being unfair. They write, Socialism in one country is the view that despite a hostile world capitalist environment and economic backwardness, they're talking about Soviet Russia, under the epoch of imperialism, socialism can survive in individual countries. This is because the imperialist epoch is marked by conflict and war, which leave the imperialist front liable to be breached in individual countries. And they go on to cite Lenin's position from 1915, where I quote, Lenin says, uneven economic and political development is an absolute law of capitalism. Hence, the victory of socialism is possible first in several, even in one capitalist country alone. At first blush, that seems pretty clear. Um, in that quote, it does give the impression that Lenin was arguing it was possible to achieve socialism in a single country. Was that Lenin's position? No, I think um, it, it definitely wasn't. What they're doing here is they're mixing up different terms. I mean, we can go into it a bit la- later on, the different terminology that's being used. But basically, they're, they're, and obviously, when you pick an isolated quote for an article, you can then make it seem like something else by just picking like a few phrases and then making it seem like something it's not. What Lenin is talking about here is the possibility of the workers taking power, of basically having a socialist revolution, as we would talk about it, uh, you, the workers taking power in one country is possible, right? You don't need to take possible in all countries all at the same time. And he's arguing this against the second international, like the uh, opportunists, the reformists at the time, who were arguing um, that it was impossible during wartime 
to proceed towards the socialist revolution and they found various arguments against this including then the argument that well because of the division of the uh, proletariat and so on uh, the war and all these things you couldn't uh, uh, have a socialist revolution coming out of the war now history was proven proved them quite wrong and they proved Lenin right I think it might be worth just saying a little bit what the Marxist position is was on this question and which by implication the both Stalin and the Communist League would uh, uh, agree was the Marxist position before 1924 uh, or before the Russian Revolution at least and that is that you have to build socialism uh, on a world scale that that's the basis on which you have to build and that's not just from and they they keep talking about this and they they say oh, no no we do need socialism on a world scale but only for the final victory of socialism in order to prevent this is the only way to ensure in a permanent final and so on way that there will not be um, military intervention that will overthrow uh, uh, socialism but this is the wrong way of looking at the question uh, of course military intervention is one of the risks faced faced by the young worker state and certainly in the first few years after the Russian Revolution Russia was, or the Soviet Union was invaded by 21 imperialist armies. It, the, at that time, the military question was a, a, a real and very tangible threat. But if we move on after that, then the question, the economic question becomes much more uh, prominent. This is, if you look at Lenin's writings, uh, his, uh, his attention is focused on the economic question, Trotsky as well. Uh, in the years following uh, the civil war and how to proceed towards securing the Soviet uh, state, securing the workers in power uh, under the conditions they found themselves in. Um, but the Marxist position it starts off from the question where we need a world socialist uh, uh, revolution in order to uh, secure. And this is based because Socialism has to be built on the advanced productive forces, on an advanced economy. Basically, the idea, well, the the um, uh, capitalism by developing the productive forces, developing machinery, technology, and so on, creates the possibility for socialism by uh, ad- by raising the productivity of labor, by making workers more efficient, so that we can uh, liberate ourselves from we can. Lo- uh, shorten the working day and workers can take part in the planning of production. The very creation of the working class was because of the development of machinery and so on, which created the working class instead of the previous system of uh, apprentices, journeymen and masters and so on. And the work, you, uh, uh, working class arose instead. But this, the capital, this capitalism arose with, inside its national boundaries, but it also reached the limits. The development of productive forces was such that the national boundaries were no longer sufficient to contain uh, the productive forces, and they needed to expand beyond the national boundaries. And this is when you have, basically, to get a long story short, this way of development of imperialism, which they do mention, the development of imperialism, but they use it in the wrong way, actually. Because development of imperialism actually means that the, capital, the productive force have outgrown the national boundaries, which means they need to be developed on an international scale in order to develop them further. And if you look at today, this is, this is so obvious. I mean, look at the production of aircraft, for example, Airbus. Now, Airbus wings are not produced in France or in Germany, where the actual plane is put together, but the Airbus wings for some is produced in Britain. Right, and then they're exported, despite the Brexit, they're exported to France or to Germany, then to be fitted onto uh, the plane. Sometimes the bits of the middle part of the plane are also produced. The engines, some of the engines are produced in Britain, and so on. Other parts in other parts of uh, Europe or the rest of the world. So this is, and this is the way it's the case with all industries. So no, the industries now span the globe, right? And to develop the industries to that level, it was necessary for them to start spanning uh, the globe and the international trade was necessary. And this massively improves the how productive workers are, that is how much they can produce in a single working day, uh, and therefore also how much possibility we have for creating the wealth needed to fund uh, uh, civilized living standards for the workers, workers, but also to give them the free time in order to then uh, develop uh, be able to control production, develop arts, develop culture, education, uh, and so on. So this is the necessary preconditions 
the the, the internationalization, the international productive forces spread across the globe um, is a necessary precondition to develop socialism. Yeah, and I think that you know, with the greatest of respect to our comrades in the YCL, they take the question in quite a mechanical and one-sided way because they present the issue as though the only limit on the development of socialism is the threat of invasion, the threat of military conquest. But the point that not just Lenin, but Marx and Engels were making all the way back in the 1800s was that capitalism is a global system of production and therefore it has to be fought and overthrown on a global basis. You cite in an article which I recommend in the latest issue of the In Defense of Marxism magazine, which is available to order now, themed around the question of internationalism, that Marx and Engels and the German ideology write that it's as a result of the development of the productive forces under capitalism that each nation is dependent on the revolution of the others. And you also cite the 1850 address to the Communist League Central Committee, which is in the sort of aftermath the decline of the revolutionary wave of 1848 which was an international movement it was defeated we covered that in an episode of the previous podcast series but marx said while the democratic petty bourgeois wish to bring the revolution to a conclusion as quickly as possible it is in our interest and task to make the revolution permanent until all more or less possessing classes have been forced out of their position of dominance, until the proletariat has conquered state power and the association of proletarians not only in one country but in all the dominant countries of the world has advanced so far the competition among the proletarians of these countries has ceased and that at least the decisive productive forces are concentrated in the hands of the proletarians. We'll come back to the fact that Marx uses the term permanent in relation well, to the This is where Trotsky revolution. gets the word from. Exactly, but we'll, we'll come back to that association later. But can we just clarify to make sure that we're not um, falling into sophistry here? Because you could interpret this, and you could interpret some of what Lenin said as saying that it is possible to have socialism in a country, but in order for that regime not to eventually be crushed one way or another, there have to be revolutions subsequently elsewhere. There has to be a revolutionary process that goes on elsewhere in the world. But is it possible to achieve socialism as such in a single country? What do we actually mean by that? Because we don't think that the USSR was capitalist. We agree the capitalists were overthrown, the capitalism was expropriated and abolished. So was what you had in the USSR therefore socialism? No, so that that's the point that make. I mean, basically, by declaring that this was socialist, you're basically then saying, well, the conditions for socialism were uh, ready and available in Russia at that time, right? Or uh, that they could be developed on the basis of Russia alone, that the productive forces could be developed within inside the confines of the Soviet Union. We should remember though, as well that the Soviet Union here is uh, one of the largest nations in the world, uh, one of the largest countries by geography, lots of national resources and so on. Um, so if it were, were to be possible in one country, probably Russia, the Soviet Union would be the one where it would be possible. But um, this theory hasn't just been ad- applied to the Soviet Union, but to all kinds of much more smaller states like Cuba, like uh, the states of Eastern Europe and so on. And it's, uh, it, it's even more wrong there than it was in the Soviet Union. So but by saying that you can have socialism on the basis of basically backward productive forces, right? Productive forces were not developed to the level of imperialism, as, as Lenin says, the highest stage of capitalism is imperialism. We have productive forces at a lower level in a backward country, which we uh, agree that Russia was. It was not as of economically developed, very large peasantry and a small working class. If we say that you can build socialism on that basis, basically what you're doing is you're abandoning a materialist position on what socialism is. Uh, And you can see that then happening uh, in the theory of the various uh, parties that followed Stalin subsequently, where all kinds of strange ideas regarding that you could basically build, you know, return to primitive communism and so on, all kinds of uh, strange ideas. And that was never uh, the position. Well, the position of Lenin and Trotsky was that after the revolution, what you had is basically a transitional regime. That's in a regime that had begun, your workers had taken power, and they had they were in a transition from uh, the old capitalist, at least to some extent Russia was capitalist, towards socialism, and it's transition. And this is the terminology that was used uh, at the time. 
to describe what was taking place. And that makes sense, right? Because it can seem that was meant to be in transition from one to the other. And, but it was a worker state, the workers were in power, but the economic conditions was, did not exist for, uh, to start the building of socialism as they um, later. Uh, this is the argument of, of Stalin and Bukharin was that the economic, that basically you could start the building of socialism in Russia alone. But that, that's not true. You could not do that without the re- development of uh, the revolution in the West. And I think that I'm correct in saying that Marx and Engels were of the view that capitalism would break at its strongest point, that where the working class was most developed, a country like Germany or a country like Great Britain, that was where the revolutionary process, the international revolutionary process would begin and that weaker, less developed economies would follow. But that's not the way the history played out, was it? No, yeah. Um... And I think actually towards the end of, I think Engels at least, um, to end, end of his life, he started considering that maybe this might not be the case. It's one of the uh, colonial countries or the more economically backward countries would be the one to um, overthrow capitalism first. He starts writing about both Ireland and Russia. Ireland was a colony of Britain at the time. Um, uh, wrote about them in 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 these terms, he started thinking about this question, which then obviously, but for the Russian revolutionaries, this take, took on a much more sharper question, because Engels, of course, was based in Britain, in Europe, in Western Europe, and so on. But for Russia, the, uh, the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, or the revolutionaries in Russia at that time, this became much of a sharp question. What are they actually fighting for? Are they fighting to overthrow the Tsarist Empire in order to create a bourgeois democratic republic? like had been in the case in what the revolution was fighting for in Germany in 1848, for example, or were they fighting for something else? I, are they fighting for socialism? What was, and this was obviously a question that was posed quite concretely, and for Engels it was an abstract question, for these it was a very concrete question that they had to face. And this is where Trotsky starts developing uh, his idea around 1905, uh, in the period just leading up to the revolution and then in the revolution after the revolution and he starts developing then what became known as the theory of the permanent revolution and to be clear trotsky was a very much minority view prior to 1905 uh, that it was possible that the workers could begin carrying out socialist tasks ahead of workers elsewhere in the world. Lenin had the view that the revolution in Russia would be bourgeois democratic, but the workers should maintain political independence. Yeah, he, his, his formulation wasn't quite, uh, wasn't that specific, I would say. He said that it would be the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. And he left it at that, which, I mean, in a sense, you could say that this is what uh, took place, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, the full story. He didn't. Ex- he hadn't come out clearly on the side that, well, what will be posed will be the socialist tasks, right? We will go from the democratic task, democratic revolution, land reform, uh, the overthrow of Tsarism, yeah. um, a constitution, a Duma, a parliament. You will move on from those tasks immediately towards socialist tasks: the nationalization of the banks, the nationalization of the railways, the nationalization of the main industries, uh, and. Uh, uh, the workers taking power and uh, workers being at the head of the revolution rather than being uh, on an equal basis to the peasantry because it was very much the workers that led the revolution in 1917 and this is what then uh, Trotsky Lenin says said about the revolution that capitalism broke at its weakest link and I think that's quite a profound statement uh, it's better than saying this was like the breach in the imperialist front which uh, was later used because it says, you know, you have one link in the chain of capitalism was broken, the weakest link, because capitalism was least developed, and the whole, uh, uh, the fetters that capitalism placed on development in uh, Russia was far, far stricter. And the crisis of the regime, trying to balance between all the different contradictions in the Russian Empire at the time, all these meant that capitalism broke down first in Russia, uh, but under the pressure of the war, of course. And this, and so it broke his weakest link, but obviously the point was, you could break one link, you go move on to breaking the next link in the chain, right? This is the role of 
uh, the world revolution. There's, so Trotsky's resolution was, we've talked a bit about Lenin's resolution, Trotsky's uh, solution to the problem. The Mensheviks and event wound up basically with the solution that, well, because the productive forces haven't been sufficiently developed in Russia, therefore we need to first have the bourgeois democratic revolution, with the bourgeois to task, the parliament and so on, and the workers should merely act as a pressure point on the bourgeois to try to um, push them to against Tsarism, to push them towards uh, overthrowing Tsarism. Uh, and this was, so, th- so they were basing themselves on the level of productive forces developing Russia was insufficient for uh, the workers to take power. But the point was, and this is the point that Lenin makes in imperialism, that on a world scale, in his book on imperialism, he said on the world scale, the productive forces had developed and they were even, and they were ripe for world, for uh, socialism on the world scale. Not in Russia on its own, but on a world scale. So obviously, but obviously the consequence of that is to, is that on, in order to build socialism, you must then <laughs> win over the advanced capitalist countries, right? The imperialist countries. That's the way, that's on the, that basis you can build. Because if you limit yourself to the, uh, only the uh, Russia, and they talk sometimes about, uh, uh, in this post, they also talk about, in, Lenin sometimes says, oh no, but I'm talking from an internationalist point, uh, internationalist point of view, an international point of view. But there is no national point of view. Or if you were talking from a purely national point of view, there would not be the conditions for socialism in Russia. Right, but it was because of the advanced productive forces internationally on a world scale that Lenin said this was possible to uh, advance to the socialist revolution. Um, and so I think that um, Russia's capitalist class in and of itself was a dominated and weak, uh, dominated by imperialism. They were tied completely to Western, French and English capital in particular, some German as well, but mainly French and English. And this was uh, the so Lenin's position basically was that yes we can begin we can take power we can begin and then we will but then it will have to spread to the rest of the world. There is, I mean, there are ample quotes to prove this point. One of his last articles is called "Better, Fewer, But Better." It's a very interesting article which deals about the situation they found themselves at the time with the isolation of the revolution and so on. Precisely, it is an entry into the. It's kind of is a precursor to the debate which took place in 1924 and he writes the following he says the general feature of our present life is the following we have destroyed capitalist industries and have done our best to raise to the ground the medieval institutions and landed proprietorship and thus created a small and very small peasantry which is following the lead of the proletariat because it believes in the results of its revolutionary work It is not easy for us, however, to keep going until the socialist revolution is victorious in more developed countries, merely with the aid of this confidence of the peasantry days, because the economic necessity, especially under the new economic policy, keeps the productivity of labor of the small and very small peasant at an extremely low level. So basically the point he's making is that the average productivity of labor in Russia was very low at the time, particularly in agriculture. And th- this means that it's hard to hold on and c- keep going until the victory of a socialist revolution in modern violence comes. And he goes on to say, which I think is a bit of a death blow to this misuse of Lenin's quotes from 1915 by the YCL, we too lack enough civilization to enable us to pass straight on to socialism, although we do have the political prerequisites for it, i.e. the workers have taken control in that, Russia. That's right. He talk, he's talking about the workers taking power. Yeah. And sometimes you can, you can mix terminology. You know, When you write an article, you do a speech or something, you're not being 100% precise in your terminology. When he talks about socialist revolution being possible in Russia, mm. he's talking about the workers taking power. And starting the transition, uh, basically setting uh, an example for the rest of the uh, European workers to follow. Yeah, and let's be clear, in 1915, which is what, I mean, there are some other quotes from the 20s, but a lot of the quotes that the, I, the YCL use are from 1915. What's happening? You're in the middle of World War One. The Second International has completely exposed itself. It's supported its own imperialist, its own capitalist in the butchery of World War One, using the excuse of 
you know, the dim and distant prospect of socialist revolution, leaning on national chauvinism. He's basically saying to the socialist movement, there are no excuses for not fighting. This is a massive crisis of capitalism where the opportunities are ripe and what are you doing? You're backing your own capitalist, you're backing your own ruling classes rather than seizing the opportunity to take power and also speak to the comrades in his own camp, in the in the anti-war camp, in the internationalist camp. And look, I think the point that we should say here is you can always grab quotes and throw them back and forth. We've done a little bit of that here as well because it is necessary, but we can do it all day. The point is words are one thing, but deeds are another. The thread of Lenin's political argumentation, I would say, is crystal clear on this question, that it was not possible for Russia to build socialism alone, that his entire outlook was towards a European-wide revolution, a world revolution. Um, at one point, he said that he would have sacrificed the Russian Revolution in order to save the German Revolution because it was more important to the world revolution because it was a more developed capitalist country, it had a more developed working class, the prospects for socialism, the level of civilization, to use his term, uh, was more favorable. But let's talk about deeds. Lenin built the Comintern. For what purpose? And with what edicts? With what instruction? Not to just build socialism in a completely disjointed and isolated national context in France, in Germany, in Russia and elsewhere, but to fight for a single world party of communism, to coordinate a global struggle for the international overthrow of capitalism and the building of communist parties connected with one internationalist organization. And we should be clear, in 1943, Stalin dissolves that organization, which we'll come back in a little bit to the way that Stalin formulated his ideas. But I think that really eloquently illustrates indeed what Lenin stood for and by contrast what the likes of Stalin stood for. But we have to remember like that what Lenin was from 1914 onwards, right? From the beginning of the war and onwards, Lenin preoccupied himself completely with the uh, problems of the European Revolution, out of, uh, particularly Russia, of course. This is where he was... Uh, this is what the party was leading, but the problems, and he, you know, you read his writings, and he's constantly basically saying uh, that the war is a prelude to revolution, right? In not just in Russia, but in all of Europe, and so it is the tasks of the of the uh, social democrats, as they were known at the time, uh, or the revolutionaries, um, to uh, prepare. To take uh, to take a lead in the, in that revolution and take power, basically for the workers to prepare the workers to take power in those revolutionary struggles that would come out of the war, and that is precisely that's what he argued throughout the war, and that's precisely what happened. He called for a, se- a third international in during the war, precisely for that purpose, right? It's it's for the purpose of uh, advancing the course of European revolution, and if you look at how he connected that to the question of the Russian Revolution. I mean, this is during the war as well, when he wrote this book called The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, which is a very sharp book, but um, it's, it's also very, very insightful. It says, the Bolsheviks' tactics were correct. They were based not on the cowardly fear of a world revolution, not on a Philistine lack of faith in it, but on the correct and before the war and before the apostasy of the social chauvinists and social pacifists, a universally accepted estimation of the revolutionary situation in Europe. These tactics were the only internationalist tactics because they did the utmost possible in one country for development, support and awakening of the revolution in all countries. Basically, he, is, he sees his task as developing the revolution in Russia in order to support and awaken the revolution in all countries. And this is the way that he always looked upon the question. And if you could read throughout his writings, he didn't change his position, as we, uh, and we could uh, find plenty of quotes uh, to illustrate that point. But if you look at his deeds as well, the amount of time and energy is spent on the Communist International, not to develop like what it will become later on, like a sort of... Um, a diplomatic tool or a supporters club for uh, the the Soviet Union, but as revo- to develop the political leadership of the world working class. That was what he he saw in the Communist International. And if you see the debates is taking place and so on, that is how he treated that as well. Right, and this is the point: you have to deal with Lenin's entire political life in its totality. You can't just pull a few quotes and in isolation to 
illustrate a point that was contrary to that main thread. We talked a couple of times about the peculiar situation that Russia found itself in in 1917. So the working class does take power. They take power at the head of a revolution that also involves the peasantry. They expropriate capitalism and they immediately are forced to fight for their lives against, you know, dozens of invading armies, as you say. A terrible civil war breaks out where the revolutionary regime is holding on by its fingernails. What does the situation mean as far as the prospects of building socialism in Russia and indeed internationally? Because the Russian Revolution did have an impact on the class struggle throughout Europe. Yeah, so the Russian Revolution hung on by a thread for the first few years of its existence during the Civil War um, when it was invaded by uh, the 21 of Mesovic Dimension, as we from all these different neighboring countries, but also the world imperialist powers, the USA, US, Japan, Britain, France, Germany, of course, they all at one point or another got involved and attempted to overthrow the first, the worker state, also the first worker state, but the second worker state. Um, the, um, the first being the Paris Commune. That's right, the first being the Paris Commune. And so uh, they stro- held, just about held on, but then, obviously, what happens is, first of all, they get better organized, the Red Army is developed under the leadership of Trotsky, and uh, and they f- fight back, and they have success on the military front. But also more, and this is more important, um, was the development of the revolution in, uh, in Europe, which actually did develop, uh, contrary to what Challenge Magazine says, or the YCL says, um, the revolution broke out in Germany, in Austria, and there is an article about the Austrian revolution in this issue of the In Defense of Marxism magazine that we talk, that you mentioned before. Uh, you had, this is in 1918, uh, then you have the revolution in Hungary, where even the Communist Party or the, the managed to take power for a brief uh, period, um, and there was also, obviously, Move, big movements in France uh, and there were big movements in Britain at this time. So this all made it possible uh, because of propaganda to the soldiers that were fighting. So there are some famous leaflets that were sent to the British soldiers that were fighting in uh, northern Russia about how they should turn the weapons against their own ruling class and so on. And this had an echo among the soldiers and in particular had an echo among the workers uh, in Britain. Uh, this general idea and the sympathy which the Russian Revolution gained and basically forced the ruling classes one after another to withdraw their uh, armies from uh, the Soviet Union and, and stop the invasion. Um, and so uh, the revolution was developing but it was defeated and this is what really then gave an imp- so the German Revolution, defeat of the German Revolution in the autumn of 1923 this is what really um, uh, gave an impetus to the, this debate on socialism in one country. Before you go any further, I just want to refer back to the YCL because they say that in October 1917, after the Bolsheviks established the world's first socialist state in Western Europe, the possibility of further revolutions seemed dim. You had Hungary, you had Austria, you had Germany, you had a wave of revolutionary movements that broke out after the Russian Revolution, all the way up, I would say, in that first wave until the revolutionary general strike in Great Britain of 1926. So far from dim, okay, ultimately they were defeated for various reasons, all relating really to the uh, crisis of leadership. Uh, In the case of the Chinese Revolution of the 1920s, which we'll come on to because of, almost directly because of terrible advice from Stalin, but nevertheless... You had a wave of revolutions. The prospects for world revolution, a revolution in Western Europe, were not dim. They were actually very bright, despite the ultimate defeats that had consequences as far as Russia's concerned. How, how can you possibly square a statement like this? With you, the can even, you can even add Sweden and Italy, more importantly, to the list. Nicholas is very keen to make sure that we add Sweden. <laughs> Italy is, yes, one of the key countries in Europe, right, along with uh, Germany and France and Britain. Um, and so all this, was, so there was tremendous, but the, the communist parties of the Communist International proved not to be up to the task. And so the revolution was, uh, in one country after another, was defeated. 
Um, and this is what provoked then this debate on socialism on country, where basically you could say that um, the right wing, led by Bukharin, uh, as well as the center, led by Stalin, they basically made the virtue out of necessity. So the revolution had been isolated in the Soviet Union or Russia, and uh, it did. It, there was no immediate prospect, but they weren't. They weren't. Didn't last. Lo- they didn't, this situation didn't last for long. <laughs> 1926 general strike in Britain was only two years down the line, uh, as was the Chinese Revolution. But uh, for, for 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 a moment, it seemed the pr- prospects of further continuing the revolution uh, uh, had to be postponed onto the future. And then this idea then emerges of basically saying, well, maybe we can just manage on our own. Maybe we don't need a ro- world revolution. Um, we have managed so far, haven't we? Basically, and then. Uh, and then this was combined with the policy, economic policy they had to adopt in 1921. So this, this is the new economic policy, right? That's right, the this... new economic policy, which we mentioned in the quote before, which is basically where you opened up for capitalism inside yeah. uh, the Soviet Union. You gave concessions to uh, farmers to yeah. develop sell their products farming, for a profit on a small, scale. Uh, limited trading of uh, goods on on a capitalist basis small development of small industries you made concessions to multinational companies to come in and invest in certain parts of russia and certain industries and so on and this was all necessary because of the conditions it was like it was like it was like defibrillating the stalling economy in the in the short run that's right it it did have it it did succeed in loosening some of the problems that uh, uh, emerged and the bottlenecks that emerged during the civil war and to return some confidence also uh, of the peasantry in the government, which allowed yeah. to sell its grain and so on, and to make, uh, yeah, rather than having it requisitioned. Um, and it helped started the wheels of economy growing. But as part of that, there was a day, it rose, obviously, you'd start letting capitalism develop, and it starts to develop a dynamic of its own. But this is, uh, so in 1924, when talking about, this had started to take place. And Trotsky and was warning, and the, uh, um, and the left position were warning about this taking place, right? The, the capitalist tendencies were starting to emerge, and this was threatening uh, the alliance between the workers and the peasantry. Um, and this was a, a key point I was making. And this was linked to this discussion because basically the idea was of the right wing of Bukai was you can keep going with this kind of uh, uh, development of uh, uh, capitalism within inside uh, the Soviet Union. And this would enable you to move to develop the economy and therefore build on Russia alone, uh, build socialism by allowing the um, capitalism to develop. It's bit contradictory but that was basically the idea that he was putting forward so the idea was don't worry about the world revolution uh don't need that don't, don't need to further upset and upheaval and so on we can put ourselves on this track uh we can build socialism at the snail's pace as, uh, Bukha- tempo, I think it was. tempo as tempo as bukain as he put it bukain and Stalin basically leaned into this. He was leaning on the right wing in order to um, strike blows against the left wing. And um, so he he also, and at this time then, he it suited him as well to adopt this uh, socialism in one country uh, idea. And you can see why, given years of war, the total exhaustion of the workers and the increasing frustration of the peasantry compounded by then the distortions created by the NEP, why people would find a certain appeal in the message that, look, we just need a break, we just need a rest, we just need to consolidate what we've got, and we'll deal with the world revolution at some far-flung point in the future. There was an objective basis that stemmed from the disappointment of the failure of the world revolution that provided the kind of ballast for this idea yeah and that's it was um we say it was a bit of a uh you know a comforting story right i in the face of a defeat of the world revolution which they had pinned their hopes on and now it was like it was basically a comforting story that we could manage without it right we don't need a world revolution but uh it, it you might, so you might say, oh, what's the problem then? I mean, what's the problem with this theory? Uh, it's just um, like 
because where are the differences and and the YCL claims which I think is erroneous it claims that Trotsky Trotsky's position was oh no no you just have to passively await the arrival of the world revolution yeah we just in Russia we'll just sit back we'll not try to build socialism we'll just wait for the western working class to get their act together and have their revolution yeah which is uh which is not at all i mean it's it's a non i mean it's a nonsensical position why would anyone take such a position um uh, but uh and certainly wasn't trotsky's position and if you look at what his writings at the time as i said they raised this problem he raised this problem along with the rest of the left opposition they raised it's the problem of the grain uh, on the peasantry and the alliance with the workers and the peasantry, which everyone understood as another thing they say, oh, Trotsky doesn't understand the alliance with the workers and the yeah, peasantry. Yeah, they dragged that old chestnut out in this uh, Twitter thread as well. Yeah, but it's it's completely wrong. He he was very much concerned about it because he, just like Lenin, understood the importance of the majority, yeah. the overwhelming majority peasant country that they needed the alliance with the workers. Look, you read Results and Prospects, which was published in 1906, on the basis of the experience of the 1905 revolution in which Trotsky played the leading role. It's where he developed the theory of permanent revolution. Uh, this is where he really wrote it down in full. And there are huge passages of that text devoted to the centrality of the peasantry, the necessity of winning over the peasantry, of the working class finding a route to the peasantry. He says that it's a prerequisite for a successful revolution in Russia. And he was absolutely right about that. And in fact, the defeat of 1905 was in no small part because the main bulk of the peasantry organized in the armed forces at the time weren't on board. Um, and it was proven true in the positive by the experience of October 1917, where the peasantry organized in the army and won over by the revolution did form an alliance with the working class, with the workers at the head, and the revolution was a success and they overthrew capitalism. So it's complete slander to say that Trotsky didn't care about, or worse, um, which is the argument presented by the YCL and that I've seen a number of times, that Trotsky was somehow hostile towards the peasantry or thought that the peasantry would turn on the working class inevitably. It's complete nonsense. There's nothing of that in Trotsky's arguments. No, but he was wor- warning and about the dangers of them turning against the working class yeah. on the basis of, um, well, at one point it was on the basis of the uh, uh, failure of war communism mm-hmm. during the Civil War. Uh, and then, secondly, on the basis of uh, the contradictions that were developing in the countryside as a result of the NEP. Yes. Where, where you have a certain w- uh, part of the uh, peasantry which are becoming richer and so on and developing basically a material incentive Mm -hmm. towards further capitalist pro-capitalist measures the kulaks who bukharin told to enrich themselves that's right and which later on obviously so so left opposition put forward what we need in order to solve this problem because what you need to give you need something to give to the peasantry right Mm. Uh, so the peasantry produce the grain and so on we need to give them something back Right. The, otherwise, I mean, you can give them money, but what's the point of money if you can't actually buy any goods for it? Mm. So he was saying you need to industrialize. You need to industrialize in order to be able to provide provide the industrial products to give back to the peasantry in exchange for the grain. Basically, yeah. peasantry who were at that time living in medieval conditions. Who That's right. You need were to... in crying need of the kind of. There is actually some really moving photographs from the Civil War of peasant families being. Um, given radios showcasing the power of industrial production and you see these families completely mesmerized families who've been living in conditions that are probably identical to like the 14th century suddenly presented with you know a, a miracle of technology this was a huge swathe of the country that was crying out for development that's right and obviously the the risk was that the capitalist west would provide the goods. Mm-hmm. So the, the, basically the development of a black market where the grain were being produced by the peasants, for example, in Ukraine, a very productive region, um, or in the, that part of... Uh, it was only part of Ukraine that was part of the Soviet Union at the time, but nonetheless, uh, the rich agricultural areas where the capitalist agriculture was developing fastest, and the, the trade would begin then with the West in one form or another. So Western industrial goods would pass in and the... Uh, grain would be coming out uh, and this would very quickly then propel uh, create the basis for a capitalist um, 
uh, pro-capitalist opposition in Russia, which then, although the monopoly of foreign, tra this trading relationship never started, but the pro-capitalist opposition did emerge. And you have, in the, then in 1928, um, you have then what they, they call, there was a strike of the Kulaks, who wouldn't bring the grain to the market, basically, uh, demanding uh, relaxations, deregulation, and so on, the right to trade with the West, uh, because they could see from their own narrow point of view why this would be beneficial. And so Trotsky had argued for this, uh, the need to industrialize, and he and the left opposition, they put forward the need for five year, uh, a five-year plan of industrialization. Now, this has been known, no, everyone knows about the five-year plans, but very few people know that this was an idea put forward by the left opposition in order to try to resolve this problem. And what does, of course, in 1928, when this crisis erupts, there is a choice faced by the then quite well-entrenched bureaucracy of state bureaucracy, who then have the choice between either uh, 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 restoring capitalism which or continue further along that line, which is the line that Bukharin argued for at the time, Bukharin and Tomsky, or they could basically do an 180 degree turns and abandon the NEP. And this is what they did. So in 1928, they abandoned the NEP uh, and they basically introduced, although there were lots of distortions, that they introduced uh, uh, a caricature version of the program of the left opposition. Um, so the idea of basically that that uh, Trotsky didn't pay any attention to or wasn't prepared to uh, um, advance a program for the development of the economy in the Soviet Union, even in the absence of the World Revolution. That's completely wrong. But the point is that this could only be temporary measures and you, in, then you need to uh, uh, develop the World Revolution in order to make, make uh, to, pro to create a solid foundation basically for uh, this. So we've said already that Stalin tended to view the question of building socialism in one country through narrow militarist terms. Basically, as long as you could avoid being invaded, then it was possible to build socialism. You find a little you find a little chink in the imperialist front and you can be you can make a little fortress for yourself where you can be left alone sufficiently long to build socialism, even when capitalism is still general on the world stage. But in order for that to succeed, you need to find a rapprochement with at least some layers of the capitalists abroad, because otherwise they're going to constantly be knocking at your door. And this had disastrous effects when it came to the foreign policy of the Soviet Union. That's right. So you obviously uh, in this uh, all kinds of diplomatic deals, and there might be some diplomatic deals which are necessary. And as I said, the Soviet they did make some even concessions to the capitalists. Let them have they would pay their money to invest in this, uh, or give them exchange concessions to invest in Russia itself, and so on. Um, and these are not necessarily, uh, you know, it, it's not a disaster. These are the kind of things that were. Uh, a necessity in that situation they found themselves in uh, being isolated um, but the problem was that they turned this um, they made uh, impermissible concessions and they started making impermissible concessions um, I think the most striking example of this is uh, China and you, the logic is this right you you have socialism you pointed out you have socialism in one country and then what is needed from the other parties of, us, of the Communist International now is no longer to overthrow because you have socialism in one country. What is needed now is to support socialism in one country, the socialism in Soviet Union, right? That's what we need to do. We need to support that, not overthrow uh, capitalism in uh, Britain or France, but merely to ensure that there's no imp imperialist intervention coming from Britain or France again that can overthrow the socialism which we are building the, the construction of socialism in the Soviet Union right so now you have a situation it's not so much waiting for the revolution in the West but you're waiting for the construction of socialism in the Soviet Union right that's the, the, the starting to have in the communist parties and as part of that they then try to develop friendly relationship with the, the, the bourgeois regime in China 
saying, well, because it was uh, at least partly against imperialism and so on, uh, or making noises in that regard. So we have, and this is Chiang Kai-shek or the Kuomintang. And so they went to the extent where they invited uh, Chiang Kai-shek to become an uh, observer in the ECCI, as they call the Executive Committee of the Communist International, um, which is, and basically uh, created all kinds of illusions in what he, obviously in order to try to get friendly relations, because they didn't have a lot of friends at the time, so trying to get friendly relations with the Bourgeois regime in China. But then when the revolution comes along in China, basically they're completely unprepared because Shanghai, uh, the workers take power in Shanghai and the Kuomintang regime, being a bourgeois regime, clamps down uh, and drowns this early attempt of the workers uh, in blood. And the Communist International are completely unprepared for this because their whole attempt had been to try to develop a friendly relationship with uh, this regime. And this then is repeated in country after country. You have the 1926 general strike, where the Communist Party have been trying to develop a friendly relationship with the leaders of the TUC, the Trades Council in Britain, or the left of the Trades Council. But then during the general strike, when the Trades Council completely betray um, uh, the general strike, then they are, the, uh, the TUC betrays the uh, general strike, then they are completely unprepared again for this betrayal and have uh, tied their fate to uh, the left of uh, the TUC, uh, which also betrays um, the struggle. And so in, in country after country, when the revolution then does take place, it actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because of the strategy of the, com because the abandonment of the world revolution. Now it's not just that the world, rev they are, they are basically not preparing for the world revolution. They're not advancing the world revolution. And as a result, they're further isolating or continuing the isolation of the Soviet Union. Yeah. It's like a religious argument. You know, when they say, whence cometh evil? Well, God's given us the best of all possible worlds. If the revolution succeeds, then it was always supposed to succeed. So the party leadership was right. If it fails, then it was always supposed to fail. So the party leadership was still right. It's a kind of post facto justification of every disaster that arose from this total revision of the fundamental principles of internationalism that are inherent to Marxism and always were. Um, yes, Lenin so that's, that's the kind of thing that you have. In, the, the argument, you can see a trace. When, when, this, when this YCL, I'm not sure exactly what they're thinking, but they, it's a short post, they don't explain themselves that much. But when they say that there was no prospect of, revolu uh, of revolution in Europe, the only way to interpret that is to think, well, the revolution was defeated in Germany in 1923, and therefore the prospects of revolution in Europe were dim. But the truth is that revolution with uh, a correct leadership could have been successful. Yes. And then world history would have transformed. We would yeah. not have been sitting, having this conversation here. It would have completely transformed world history if there had been successful in Germany. Well, an even more disastrous example in some respects than China was the outcome of the Spanish Civil War, where the Stalinists ended up playing a completely counter-revolutionary role and essentially helped hand over Spain on a plate to Franco and the Falange. That's a story for another podcast. We've covered it previously. Yeah, but it, it, it's the same. Basically, the attempt at that time was to find an alliance with France and mm. Britain. And they're right. fairly public about this. If you if you read, you can read, for example, Hobsbawm, the yes. Communist Party historian. He writes, he said, no, no, it was necessary to fr sacrifice the Spanish Revolution in order to get an alliance with France and Britain. Now, if you then look at what happened uh, to prove yourself, basically, that we're against revolution... The Communist International needed to prove itself that it was against the revolution in order to get an alliance with France and a pro-democracy alliance with France and Britain. But then what does France do and Britain do, right? Uh, they do not ally against with the Soviet Union against Hitler after the Spanish. Rather, the other way around, they made a deal with Hitler trying to get Hitler to invade the Soviet Union first. Right. You have the famous... Um, Munich Agreement, mm. where they handed over bits of uh, uh, Czechoslovakia to uh, Germany, um, and so on. Then, of course, a number of other things happened we can't go into, but that was the first response of the Allies. There was no alliance that was forthcoming. 
as a result of this. Uh, and at every turn of events, this proved actually uh, detrimental to the survival of the Soviet Union, these uh, kind of policies. Well, speaking of the Second World War and the survival of the Soviet Union, the YCL ends their post by saying that had the strategy of socialism in one country been abandoned and the USSR simply waited for the workers of Western Europe to save them, fascism would not have been halted in World War II. It was the the Red Army of workers and peasants and the power of the planned economy that defeated fascism in World War II, despite the mistakes and despite the crimes of Stalin and the leadership. And then they say that socialism in the USSR lasted longer than anyone thought possible. That's true, actually. Trotsky himself didn't think that the USSR would last for as long as it did. But A, as we said, it wasn't socialism. And B, where's the USSR now? I mean, there never seems to be an answer to this question. The fact is, the USSR did collapse. It was true that it sustained itself for longer than anticipated, but it didn't sustain itself forever. And it should the... be added there as well. Uh, in after the Second World War, capitalism was abolished in almost half the world. Right. So many countries in Africa, for the colonial revolution and so on, where they abolished capitalism. China, obviously, in 1949, the Chinese Revolution was a tremendously important event in world history. Capitalism was actually abolished in a whole bunch of countries. Now, there was lots of distortions in this process and so on, which we don't have time to go into, but that, that, that was a factor. So, you actually, in a sense, the revolution did spread. What it didn't spread to was the advanced capitalist countries. And that was the key question. I mean, if you look at Lenin, Marx, and Engels, this is, like, this is the key question. We need to spread the revolution to advanced capitalist countries. And speaking of China in 1949, they also say that China stands as the greatest example of socialism in one country. Yeah, well, this is uh, uh, the restoration of capitalism in China. It's obviously something that have completely passed them by. And it's very ironic that they post this post as well, like almost at exactly the same time as Xi Jinping has announced a massive hundreds of billions of dollars of giveaway to the stock exchange, basically, in order to boost the value of the stock exchange. Um, so this is a great irony. Obviously, what, um, what wound up in the outcome, final outcome of socialism in one country was not socialism in one country, it was socialism nowhere. And that's the end result of uh, this whole uh, uh, experiment, if we want to call it that. But just to end this discussion... I know that when this debate comes up, and it's true of other debates in the history of our movement as well, some people will say, look, at the end of the day, you're dealing with disagreements in principle between long dead people over revolutions that have long since been defeated. What's the relevance of any of this today? You know, People are dying in Gaza. There's a massive global economic crisis. There's a war going on in Europe. Why does it matter that we clarify our perspective on this question of socialism in one country? The, this whole approach of this narrow national approach has huge implications for the whole approach of the communist movement, the abandonment of the world revolution. We don't necessarily have time to go into all of that. But I think the most striking thing I would say is like, what would happen if the workers were to take power uh, today in a country like France, for example. What if the workers took power in France? What would be the next step? Well, they certainly still couldn't build a self-sufficient socialist economy, even in an advanced capitalist country, because you'd still be surrounded by capitalism as a world system. You still wouldn't have all the resources you required. You'd still require you know, friendly relations with other regimes, other workers' states. So even today, even with all the advantages that the workers have compared to over 100 years ago in 1917, you still couldn't build socialism in a single country for a start. Yeah, and I, I, I get asked this question some, quite a lot, like, you know, at, you know, discussing, you know, what's the prospect of a communist revolution? What would you do uh, in, in this situation? And obviously, you took power, you take power, and, uh, and you, you would make an, you'd have to make an appeal. I, yeah. France cannot build this Airbus, Airbus aircraft without wings from Britain or engines from Britain or whatever it is, various components they need, all kinds of things, uh, radar, all kinds of different components from different parts of the world. But obviously the key, the key question there would be, well, we take power and then we make an appeal to the workers of the rest of Europe to follow suit. And that appeal would be 
uh, tremendously popular, I think. It would show the way forward for the workers of Europe, not just Europe, but of the whole world. And I mean, the same would be country like if, if the workers were to take power in India uh, or any other country. It would be such a, a signal to the rest of the world working class that, look, we can take power, we can uh, begin the transformation of society towards socialism. Uh, and it would immediately then be followed, like happened in, after 1917, almost immediately, you have a revolution in a whole range of countries of workers following this uh, suit. Partly because the conditions are very similar. Conditions are very similar in Britain and in France today, right? The objective conditions, the austerity, facing austerity, facing lower wages, all, all, all these uh, questions that affect, affect uh, workers all across the world. Um, and so the similar conditions, but also just simply the inspiration to show, show as a positive example and with a tre- tremendous boost for uh, the world communist movement, as it was after 1917 with the creation of a mass communist international, which was possible on the basis of um, the Russian Revolution. Mm. And I mean, you get a glimpse of that even in recent years, not revolutions that lead to worker states, but... For example, the Great Arab Revolution of 2011 it had an international impact when you had the movement of the Greek masses against the attempt by the Troika to impose austerity in 2015. Some of the main slogans were referencing the struggle of workers in Egypt, for example. There were references to the occupation of Tahrir Square, which in turn was informed by the Occupy movement, which began a year or two prior and spread throughout the world. These were movements that were flashpoints in a context of general crisis that inspired millions of people world over. Imagine if you were to have a successful working class revolution, a successful revolution led by working people to seize power in a country like France or Britain or Germany or in India or in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or Kenya or anywhere else. It would have a huge impact. That's right. I mean, it would really also put back on the agenda, which now, because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, because of the restoration of capitalism in in China, um, socialism has been put off the agenda. And people don't conceive of it, really. Uh, Your average person does not conceive of it as an alternative, as a proper alternative to the crisis of capitalism. And it has been... uh, uh, basically it's taken off the agenda and that will put it right bang in the middle of uh, the discussions in the labor movement. Why aren't we doing what they did in this? Uh, why, why don't we follow the Indian workers? They've taken power. Surely if they can do it, we can do it. And this is what you had in the Arab Spring, right? You have all these people in the Arab world, first and foremost, like when the Tunisian workers rose up against the regime in Tunisia, then the Egyptian workers were like, well, if they can do it, we can do it. And so they they followed suit. And then you have uh, workers in Spain and in Greece who were then saying, well, if the Egyptian workers can do this, can they can overthrow their hated uh, establishment, then we can do the same. Obviously, it didn't, for various reasons, this didn't uh, transpire. But basically, you have this inspiration that these examples give to workers uh, in other countries. And, of course, if we are going to have a successful revolution in one country after another, we need to build a revolutionary international leadership, which is precisely what we're trying to do. This is the podcast of the Revolutionary Communist International. If you like what you heard or what you watched, then please do get in touch. Uh, We have sections all over the world. And if you burn for a better form of society, a more just and equal form of society, then you need to join us in the struggle against capitalism and imperialism world over. And you must also pick up a copy of the In Defense of Marxism magazine, which contains Nicholas's article about socialism in one country, as well as a number of other really excellent articles on the subject of internationalism and world revolution. Uh, well, thank you, Nicholas. It's always great having you on. And I hope that the comrades of the YCL receive this podcast in the spirit of comradely debate in which it is intended. And... That's all from us this week. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much. A spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, 
A lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism.